This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, November 29th, 2012 session in our series on green technologies and transportation. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the US Asia Technology Management Center that produces this series. I uh, also want to say a special thanks to Sunbridge Partners for additional financial support for, of this series. We'll have some refreshments outside as soon as the session is over. We really hope that you'll stay and enjoy the networking after the formal part of the presentation. So, um, also want to point out that today is the penultimate session in our series of nine presentations about green technologies. Next week, we have Mr. Lou Thompson, who is a very senior uh, consultant and advisor for uh, railway transportation. He's a member of the peer review panel that's checking up on California high-speed rail. And he's going to be talking about what the United States should learn from Asian high-speed rail projects. So that'll be the final session in our series. Before that, I'm delighted that we're able to uh, invite Mr. Steve Center, who is Vice President of the Environmental Business Development Organization inside American Honda Motors. Uh, Steve is coming up to be with us today from Los Angeles, and we really appreciate your devotion of time and effort. Right, you know, in the middle of the Los Angeles Auto Show, he was interviewed by the national press there yesterday. And so we're very happy that you could come up and, and take time to give the presentation today. Steve is a veteran of sales and marketing in the auto industry. He's worked for Honda Motors for more than 20 years. And uh, before that, he's done things like run a chain of retail uh, auto, uh, what do you call them, dealerships. So uh, Steve is a veteran of the business side of the auto industry. But two years ago, Honda, which has a very strong and long tradition that Steve will tell us more about in regard to environmentally friendly automobile technologies, asked Steve to put together this new business unit that would really combine a lot of the different technologies that are in different silos in the organization. So this is a very interesting business organizational problem that you see not only in Japan but in the US, but we're delighted that we can hear about this new business unit as well as learn more about Honda's um, power of dream. So I'll turn over the microphone to Steve at this point. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Richard, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first off, let me say congratulations on a terrific football season, <laughs> especially your big win over the Ducks a few weeks back. Now, I don't know if it's fair to call a top 10 team with three back-to-back, 10-win -back, seasons the underdog, but if I remember correctly, Oregon playing for all the marbles was a 21-point favorite going into that game. So maybe it's okay to do that. At Honda, we tend to root for the underdog. As the smallest player in the, amongst the world's biggest automakers, Honda has long played the part of the underdog. And in a similar way, maybe it sounds a little odd, in that we're a global company with 50 billion in annual revenue, but we're playing in a very high-stakes game. And yet, despite a relatively small size, or perhaps because of it, Honda's found a way to harness its maverick spirit to constantly innovate, pioneer, and prosper in the face of tough competition. Maybe no place more so than in the area of environmental technology. Today, I want to share with you some of our latest thinking for future innovation in the alternative fuel area. Not only the vehicle and powertrain advances for which Honda's best known, but also our thinking for a smarter energy and infrastructure system 
that will add new value to the alternative energy equation and support the broader adoption of alternative fuel vehicles. Maybe you can tell by my accent, or maybe you can't, but I've been on the West Coast now for about 35 years, but I'm a transplanted New Yorker. And like many others, I've been concerned about family and friends back in New York and New Jersey, and everyone there struggling to recover from the devastation from Superstorm Sandy. And watching this disaster unfold, it occurred to me that there's a role for alternative fuel technology in mitigating the impacts from these kinds of disasters. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment that your home is cut off from the grid and you've been told it could take days, even weeks, before the power comes back on. Now imagine you're driving a plug-in or electric vehicle that you could hook into your home, into your home's power system, or supply backup power to run your 52-inch TV and chill the beers for Saturday's Stanford-UCLA rematch, for example. That might be good. Further, imagine a utility infrastructure system that was smart enough to tell the same car when it was optimal to recharge based on the grid's load or minimizing CO2 emissions, even the level of renewable energy being applied to the grid at a given moment. That's the kind of thing we're looking at at Honda's Environmental Business Development Office, or EBDO, that I helped to lead. We created this new division within our sales and marketing operations about two years ago. Our job is to look at the entire marketplace of ideas and approaches to advancing alternative energy technology, both within and outside of Honda, to foster new relationships and to identify key ways in which we can bring Honda's unique technology and marketing expertise to bear. Within Honda, we're working to bridge the gaps between multiple technology disciplines, R&D programs, and marketing initiatives to create a more unified strategy for future technology deployment. Of course, the notion of environmental innovation is nothing new at Honda, and it certainly predates my time at the company. Honda's legacy of environmental leadership takes back, dates back to the early 1970s and the creation of the CVCC engine that in the Civic was the first to meet tough new emission standards under the 1970 U.S. Clean Air Act, and to do so using cheaper leaded fuel and without the need for a catalytic converter. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever put leaded fuel in a gas tank? Okay, well, I thought so. And that's about what I figured. I don't suppose you guys ever made your own mixed tapes either, did you? No, okay. <laughs> Things change. But the engineers who created that marvel, the marvel that was the Honda CVCC engine, had a rallying cry back then, and that rallying cry was blue skies for our children. And this embodies their dream to help clean up the air in cities like Los Angeles, New York, and Tokyo, and thereby improve the health and welfare of future generations. I'm gonna tell you two quick stories. When I grew up in New York, I can remember standing on Park Avenue one day with my father looking downtown at what was then the Pan Am building. And you could only see the bottom half of the building because from the middle of the building up was covered in black. When I was a child playing in the streets there, you couldn't have a white car because the buildings were constantly raining ash from the incinerators burning the garbage there. And in the late 70s, when I moved to Los Angeles to go to grad school, I was downtown at USC, and um, I realized what people said about the smog. Your eyes were burning. You found yourself short of breath. And I really couldn't see uh, much of the neighborhood. Until one day the Santa Ana winds came up, which come up from time to time, blew all the smog out to sea. Not only did I realize there were skyscrapers probably a mile from the campus, but the city was sound, uh, surrounded by beautiful mountains. And I thought to myself, that's a damn shame. Um, 30 years later, you don't have those days anymore, really. Uh, the air, there's very rarely an air quality alert day in Los Angeles. The air is clean, you can see across the city, 
And I think in great part it's due to the efforts uh, to reduce automobile emissions um, and the technologies that were applied. But that rallying cry powered Honda's continuous efforts to reduce vehicle exhaust emissions in the 80s and 90s, resulting in a series of industry firsts including the first vehicles on the market to meet California's LEV, ULEV, SULEV, and PZEV emission standards. A little translation there. The ZEVs are for zero emission vehicles, and the LEVs are for low emission vehicles. But anyway, this was significant in that the early catalyst technology was both very expensive and a major hindrance to vehicle performance. Honda's solution back then was to create a cleaner burning engine, and that flew in the face of industry critics who claimed that these new emission standards back in the 70s were practically impossible to achieve and potentially fatal to the industry. And of course, we know now that they were entirely wrong. Our efforts to reduce smog-forming emissions continue to this day. In fact, today at the LA Auto Show, we released key new details about the Accord plug-in hybrid that we'll be launching here in California and in New York right after the first of the year. The new Accord plug-in will be the first vehicle certified to meet CARB's SULEV 20 emission standard, which takes the lifetime smog-forming emissions over 150,000 miles of driving down to just 10 pounds. Now, for some perspective, our first LEV vehicles produce somewhere around 120 pounds of smog-forming emissions over their full life cycle. So you can see by that the very great distance that we've come. And those words, blue skies for our children, today remain very much part of our world. If you see anything related to our environmental efforts, you're likely to find it tagged with this Honda Blue Skies logo. But what's most important here is not the branding, but the spirit behind it at the company. Now, in respect, we can say that the original goal of Blue Skies has largely been achieved. And so our environmental vision today is shifting and is now centered strongly on energy sustainability and the reduction of CO2 emissions that contribute to global climate change. That vision is formally expressed now in Honda's environmental vision statement as realizing the joy and freedom of mobility and the sustainable society where people can enjoy life. Now that may sound a little bit too philosophical, but it captures several key points about Honda's approach to environmental innovation. The first is that Honda does not view itself as an automobile company, or a motorcycle company, or an engine company, as I was taught in grad school, but now as a mobility company. And that's an important distinction. We aren't simply thinking about how to preserve our current business model, which centers around gasoline-powered cars and motorcycles. Instead, we're thinking about what we can do to advance human mobility in all of its forms and in the process ensure the sustainability of our own business. Second, for our business to not only survive but to truly thrive, our products must bring real joy to the customer the freedom and joy of mobility. That means everything we do is focused first and foremost on the customer and creating new value for their lives. In the old fuels arena, this means making an emotional connection between the customer and the car, regardless of what's under the hood or in the trunk. It's not enough to make a product for the environment because the environment doesn't buy and use the cars. People do. And finally, with the sincere commitment to sustainability. We want to bring technologies to the market while minimizing any impact our products and our operations will have on the environment that sustains us. Realizing this vision with a more sustainable low CO2 future is a very different kind of challenge than our previous efforts on air quality. First of all, climate change is not a local or even just a national issue, but a global concern. CO2 emissions and their impact to the environment recognize no geographic, political, or social boundaries. And the emissions themselves are on a totally different scale. Where a modern automobile may emit only 10 or 20 pounds of smog-forming emissions in its lifetime, that same car 
will produce upwards of 150,000 pounds of CO2, almost one pound for every mile it travels. The challenge then is to improve fuel efficiency at the same time as we work to affect the transition away from carbon-based fuels. This will require fundamental shifts in technology, in powertrain technology, of course, but also in the infrastructure of how we produce, distribute, and consume energy in our cars, in our homes, in our factories, and our offices. Further, the most effective solutions will involve the coordinated efforts of many stakeholders across a broad range of endeavors, including also automakers, but also scientists and engineers in a wide variety of fields, as well as energy companies, policymakers, NGOs, and of course, academia. For our part, we're working diligently to address both the vehicle and infrastructure side of the alt fuel equation. On the vehicle side, Honda's pursuing what we call a portfolio approach that encompasses virtually all of the most promising technology solutions, everything from hybrids and battery EVs to natural gas and fuel cell electric vehicles. And as I alluded to earlier, soon plug-in hybrids. This is anything but a cover all your bets strategy though. Rather, it's recognition that there's no silver bullet technology or a single approach to realizing the move away from fossil fuels. It's also about ensuring the sustainability of our own business. By developing core technology know-how, we're building the foundation of our future value creation and ensuring that we can continue to bring new joy to our customers. And based on this portfolio concept, Honda's been building its engineering and marketing know-how in a deliberate, step-by-step -step way, always with an emphasis on the real-world deployments and a determined focus on the satisfaction of the customer. And this is key, especially when you're talking about new and largely unproven technologies whose focus and whose future depends on a great deal on making a very good first impression. Right now, Honda's looking to make some great first impressions with a whole new range of powertrain technologies that we're marketing under the rubric of Earth Dreams technology. This is a broad scope of technologies that will power our vehicles today and tomorrow. Once again, covering everything from more efficient engines, new hybrid technologies, to more advanced electromotive systems. At the base of the pyramid are a family of new gasoline engines using a myriad of new combustion and friction reducing technologies. These new direct, engine, direct injection engines are seeing their first application in the US in our all new Accord, which just went on sale a little more than a month ago. In the four cylinder range, this includes an all new direct injected engine with VTEC variable valve timing mated to an all new continuously variable transmission that delivers great performance and top fuel economy. CVT transmissions are more efficient. You lose a lot of energy in shifting gears. Yesterday at the LA Auto Show, we unveiled our first V6 direct injected engine in the all new flagship sedan of our luxury brand, the 2014 Acura RLX. Building these new powertrains required a multi-million dollar investment in new manufacturing technology at our engine and transmission plants in Ohio. These investments reflect the incredible competition that exists today in the race for fuel economy bragging rights. But they also speak to our understanding that the gasoline internal combustion engine will remain a significant and perhaps even dominant part of the powertrain mix for many years or even decades to come. Whether paired with electric motors and hybrid systems or as freestanding power plants, continued advances in internal combustion engine technology and fuel efficiency will be critically important for the near term. In fact, as we continue to improve IC engine efficiency, and there's still a great deal of room for further gains, gasoline engines will become an even tougher competitor for alternative systems. Diesel engines are part of the picture as well. And we've got new cleaner and more efficient diesel technology that we're launching now in Europe and in India. But the market for diesel engines here in the US remains quite small, in part because of the high cost of diesel fuel 
and the lingering bad reputation of the domestic automakers' diesel programs in the late 70s. So those of you that pumped leaded gas probably remember some of those. Frankly speaking, it's going to take our generation and older to die off before the diesel stands a real comeback in America. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, why do you think it managed quicker to overcome that bad reputation there? You know, I think um, some of it is that the manufacturers there had reliable engine products. So here, on, on top of the polluting aspect of it, um, the European manufacturers had better technology, so you didn't have the reliability issues. Next come hybrids and plug-in hybrids which in the interest of time, I'm going to tackle together. The expanded use of hybrid technology paired with more efficient engines is really at the heart of Honda's efforts to reduce CO2 emissions in the near to midterm. Hybrids offer high levels of utility, good performance, and convenience. You can fill up at any gas station. And in the case of strong hybrid systems, some unique values like quiet and responsive electric motor only operation, like our new Accord plug-in hybrid, and they have a good or at least well understood reputation in the marketplace. If you've ever driven an electric car, you'll find it's a kick. The uh, torque from electric motors is much greater than you'd have with a smaller internal combustion engine car. You don't have that gutless feeling. The acceleration is strong and uh, the fuel economy is good, even better than with uh, ICE engines. The market for hybrid vehicles really illustrates the challenge of moving a technology from fundamental viability to mass market availability. I'm talking here about cars like our own Insight, our CRZ Sporty Hybrid, and the Civic Hybrid, as well as the growing family of Prius vehicles that Toyota makes, and hybridized versions of other popular cars like Ford's Fusion and Hyundai's Elantra. These are very mainstream vehicles with a great share of mind, and yet despite their very practical capabilities and a dozen years of concerted marketing efforts across the entire industry, hybrids still represent roughly 4% of U.S. light-duty vehicle sales. And frankly, you can see an increasing number of these vehicles sold as fleets and serving as taxi cabs, among other uses. So the adoption isn't that great. In addition to the need for increased utility that comes with typical mass market sedans, the single biggest hurdle to broader market acceptance is the technology cost versus the fuel economy benefit. It's that break even point on your additional investment as a consumer, as well as concerns for long term durability and resale value. The replacement battery can be very expensive at midlife. And for plug-in hybrids, recharging infrastructure remains a significant additional drawback. I know I'm beginning to sound a little negative on hybrid technology, but that's not my intention. If we didn't see the potential, we wouldn't be making big investments like we are today. At Honda, we hope to further move the needle on the hybrid value equation with a series of new hybrid systems for small, mid-size, and larger vehicles. I already mentioned the new two-motor system in our soon-to-be-announced, or announced today, Accord Plug-in Hybrid. We provided new details at the LA Auto Show this morning with the announcement that it will achieve an EPA highway fuel economy rating of 115 MPGE in electric driving mode. That's the highest fuel economy rating of any plug-in hybrid in America. The plug-in Accord will be joined later next year by an Accord Hybrid model using the same basic two-motor system, minus the plug-in capability, and achieving 47 miles per gallon overall. Later, next, yes? How long, how long is the electric range? So it's, it's about 15 miles in electric only. 15. Later next year, we're going to introduce a three-motor system, when we call the Sport hybrid super handling all-wheel drive in the Acura RLX. I know that's a mouthful, as I've just demonstrated, but it gives you a pretty good indication of what this new system is intended to achieve. The RLX will have three electric motors, one each to power the rear wheels 
and a third motor integrated with a seven speed dual clutch transmission that together produce 90 horsepower and enable independent control of torque output at the wheels for a new level of handling performance, along with a fuel economy of 30, 30, 30, or 30 miles per gallon, the city, highway, and combined. Now how that works, uh, the super handling all-wheel drive system today uses an accelerator gear to speed up the outer wheel to help you around a turn. In the future, we'll do that electrically. A third single motor system with a focus on affordability will be deployed in smaller vehicles like the Honda Fit in the near future, but it retains the commitment to provide both fuel economy and fund the drive performance at a very high level. Taken together, we hope these new three new hybrid systems will further expand the appeal and reach of our hybrid vehicles with Honda and Acura customers around the world. One step further down the road to electrification is the battery electric vehicle. Based on the US electricity grid, well-to-wheel greenhouse gas emissions are roughly in the same basket, maybe a little bit more, than the most efficient hybrid vehicles. And what I mean by well-to-wheel is when you plug in an electric car, you have to think about how that electron was generated. And depending on where you plug in, in Ohio or Washington state, it's very different. When you take into account the move to less carbon intensive energy production here in the US, the picture gets much better. In the past year alone, the US grid has cut its carbon intensity by about 10%. That's enormous. Based on the move away from coal to compress natural gas and other sources. In California, fit EVs, well-to-wheel CO2 emissions, are roughly 100 grams per mile, about half that of a similar, similarly sized hybrid car. This is great promise in electric vehicles. Our new Fit EV is based on the popular five-door, five-passenger Honda Fit subcompact platform, which is one of our highest volume global models. Stanford's played an important role in this effort as one of three partners in our Honda electric vehicle demonstration program which we set up to, continue to conduct ongoing research on the challenge of achieving broader acceptance of electric vehicles. The Fit EV is also a great example of how our portfolio approach is paying dividends in the real world performance and value of our products in the hands of customers. With 118 miles per gallon equivalent, the Fit EV has the highest EPA fuel economy rating of any mass produced electric vehicle. I know that's beginning to sound like a familiar refrain. And that includes an industry leading energy consumption rating of 29 kilowatt hours per 100 miles and top class driving range of 82 miles. With its onboard charging system, the Fit EV also boasts the fastest recharging times at less than three hours when connected to a 240 volt circuit. This is achieved through more efficient motors, smarter bat battery management, and improve regenerative braking capacity. I want you to pay careful attention to this one. This is important. For starters, the Fit EV has a new electro servo brake system that is a further evolution of the system we developed in our FCX Clarity fuel cell electric vehicle. The system uses advanced cooperative control between the brakes and electric powertrain to achieve an 8% increase in energy recovery during braking compared with other systems on the market. Incidentally, we're using the same system in the new Accord plug-in, and that's how we get the extra range. And the Fit EV's 92 kilowatt synchronous permanent magnet motor also borrows heavily from the FCX Clarity and achieves a 94.6% efficiency rate in the EPA city test cycles. Now, I don't know if anyone here has had the opportunity to drive a Fit EV, but virtually everyone who, ha who has remarks about how incredibly fun it is. As I said before, electric vehicles are fun. As, a, as proud as we are of what we've achieved with respect to efficiency, range, and recharging performance, we're equally proud of the Fit's fun to drive nature, which is an important part of our approach to the joy of mobility. It's also a very important part of Honda's 
<coughs> of Honda's DNA. I said before, environments, <coughs> excuse me, environments don't buy cars, people do. <coughs> we launched the Fit EV this past August through select dealers in California and Oregon. The maps don't show up, I apologize. Our marketing approach is a three-year, $389 a month closed end lease that includes insurance and maintenance. We plan to expand the program to six East Coast markets beginning next year. Now, we've taken some criticism in the press for this approach, which some feel is too conservative, especially for a car this good, and which some have even labeled it as a compliance car designed primarily around California's ZEV mandate. The last one's really a red herring. All you have to do is drive the car, experience its refinement and sporty handling to realize the target wasn't simply to meet a regulatory requirement. We could have easily built cars and just put them out there. But I want to be clear about one point. In our view, retail leasing is not only the smart way to market EV technology, it's really the optimal approach and the best strategy to ensure that we create that kind of, thanks a lot, that positive customer experience that I said before was so important in the early stages of introducing these new types of technologies. Now it's tempting to take a look at the challenge of introducing alternative fuel vehicles as simply an issue of technology. But based on our experience introducing the electric vehicle, the EV Plus more than 15 years ago, and four generations of natural gas-powered Civic sedans, we have a great deal of experience in how to foster good customer attitudes toward adopting new technologies. In fact, we probably have more marketing expertise in the alternative fuel arena than anyone else in this industry. And you don't have to look too far to understand how other automakers' more aggressive hands-off approach create some early challenges with respect to customers' attitudes and confidence in the durability and value of EV technology. As some people whose job it is to foster good experiences and a good image for all fuel vehicles, these are not, frankly, positive developments. And finally, there's the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. Fuel cell cars are kind of like the B-list celebrities of the old fuel world. One minute in the spotlight, and next almost completely ignored. We feel it's the ultimate solution. In recent years, the US government's taken a rather dim view of the potential of this technology. But in just the past six months, we've seen a renewed interest on the part of the DOE and others in the future of fuel cells. And that's heartening. Because while it's absolutely wonderful for anyone to advocate strongly on behalf of a particular technology, what we don't want to see, and frankly, it's very dangerous for regulators and other influential leaders to try to pick winners and losers among the competing technologies at this stage of the game, even before the race has been run. Let's see the goals, but let's not dictate the solutions in the marketplace. Honda, for its part, remains optimistic about the long-term potential of fuel cell vehicles as the ultimate solution, as I just said, to our energy and environmental concerns. And we have invested consistently in the advancement and real-world deployment of our fuel cell technology. Previous FCX models have broken through some major technical barriers, including cold weather performance and the packaging of the fuel cell stack. And our FCX Clarity is the first fuel cell vehicle to package its powertrain in a stylish four-door sedan and with performance that's virtually on a par with a conventional gasoline-powered car. We've been leasing the Clarity on a limited basis to customers in Southern California during July of 2008. It's my plan to introduce the Clarity to the Bay Area come next year. Hydrogen fuel cell Vehicles give us a pathway to operate small, medium, and large vehicles on a renewable, carbon-free fuel, refuel the vehicle in three minutes, drive 300 miles between refueling. And three years from now, in 2015, we plan to introduce an all-new fuel cell car that showcases further advancements 
in Honda fuel cell technology, particularly with respect to the cost. In addition to hydrogen, another means of storing renewable solar energy in a chemical means is bioethanol. We're engaged in a multi-year R&D program with the National Renewable Energy Lab to study more efficient means of producing bioethanol from corn stover, the wastes. This could be used in internal combustion engine vehicles, such as our flex fuel Civic that we sell in Brazil, or in different kind of fuel cell electric vehicle. A bioethanol powered fuel cell car would operate much like a hydrogen powered FCV, with zero smog forming tailpipe emissions, but with a higher energy density and better fuel distribution and storage characteristics than hydrogen. For electric vehicles of all kinds, driving the cost down is critical. And for battery EVs, increasing range through improved battery technology is equally important. Every automaker, including Honda, is very guarded when it comes to discussing costs. We're operating in a highly competitive environment, and there's no one who will tell you with a straight face at least that they found the secret formula for financially sustainable, high production volume, sales of electric vehicles, even if we take a very optimistic view on battery technology, which assumes a doubling of energy density and having the cost in the next 10 years, we're still not within spitting distance of the gasoline internal combustion engine in terms of energy density. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, so far, we've talked almost exclusively about the vehicle piece of the puzzle. But that's only half of the chicken and chicken feed exchange of expanding old fuel vehicle deployments. The other big piece, of course, is infrastructure, which encompasses a whole range of things, including strategic expansion of recharging or refueling networks, but also smart vehicles and smart infrastructure, roads, homes, and utility grids. At Honda, we're keenly aware of the need for parallel advancements in both the powertrain technology and infrastructure solutions, as well as means of mitigating the additional strain that EVs can place on an already stressed electric grid. One really unique concept is what we call the Honda Smart Home System, which Honda has initiated with community partners in the Saitama Prefecture in Japan. The HSHS, as we call it, is installed in this demonstration test house because it smartly integrates a number of technologies to realize a major reduction in the CO2 footprint of a typical household. This includes Honda's own SIGS thin film solar panels, a rechargeable home battery unit, electricity and hot water supply co-generating unit, and what we call the smart e-mix manager which is an energy management device that optimally controls electricity supplied from the grid and energy generated by each device in the system at the house. Remember that power outage scenario I laid out at the onset of my talk? The smart emix manager reduces CO2 emissions from the home and at the same time provides a backup supply of electricity so that the house can be self-sufficient in the event of a power outage. Through this demonstration program, we hope to realize a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions from a typical household. For now, this is a Japan-only endeavor, but it's something we are taking a close look at here in the U.S. as well. Another example of Honda's effort is a new concept called the Green Wave System, which has the potential to further improve energy efficiency by helping the driver maintain optimal speed to reduce the need for traffic light stops. Think about that. Isn't that one of the most annoying things when you're driving? It utilizes vehicle infrastructure communication, incorporating data transmitted from traffic signals. And in testing in Japan, it showed up that a 7% improvement in fuel economy was achievable by simply achieving a smoother driving pattern without all of that stop and go. And believe me, with an annual expenditure on R&D of about 5% of our annual revenue, there isn't anything in the realm of mobility that we aren't working on. These kinds of innovative approaches to infrastructure development married to more efficient low CO2 vehicle technologies have the potential to transform our way of life and preserve it in the process. 
but we can affect this kind of wholesale shift in technology adoption and consumer behavior all on our own. Government entities and local, state, and national levels all have a critically important role to play in helping create an environment for these new technologies to take root and to grow. And it's not enough to simply mandate a set sales of alternative fuel vehicles without accompanying actions to spur market demand, in particular, the refueling and recharging infrastructure that will make the purchase of a natural gas, plug-in, or electric vehicle a reasonable and rational choice for a broader swath of the driving public. As any farmer will tell you, you don't plant the seed before you've tilled and nurtured the soil. Even the most fertile plant won't bear fruit if it's sown in fallow earth. It took us a hundred years to build up the infrastructure for gasoline powered cars. But we don't have a hundred years to do the same thing for the next generation of technologies. But at Honda, we're taught to always go forward with a challenging spirit and a sense of optimism. And so I wanna leave you with some nice change image of how this might all come together someday in the not too distant future. So, it's Monday morning in my neck of the woods, and this poor guy, let's call him Charlie, is leaving his home in Orange County, headed for an 8 a.m. meeting in Santa Monica. It's really bad to be Charlie. Right now, he'd have to leave around 5.30 a.m. to cover the 57 miles on the gridlocked 405. But there was a power outage in the middle of the night, and it screwed up his alarm clock, and now he's running late. And to make matters worse, Charlie forgot to stop for gas last night. So somewhere along the way, he's gonna have to hit a gas station. And it speeds averaging seven miles an hour, bumper to bumper traffic, queuing lights to re-enter the freeway. The guy is gripping the wheel so hard he starts to sweat. And then he makes the potentially fatal mistake of looking down at his phone and bam, he rear-ends someone. And that's what passes for America's love affair with the car on most days in Southern California. And I know it's not much different up here in the Bay Area because I've lived here as well. But maybe there's a better way. Let's rewind the clock. Charlie Sally. And Sally has a plug in a cord that when she pulled into the garage last night reminded her it needed a charge. Sally's smart. Once plugged in, the car and the grid have a conversation and decide the optimal time to make sure you have a full charge when she leaves the next morning while minimizing the CO2 emissions and strain on the grid. There's still a power outage, but the Honda Smart Home covers the gap so she doesn't wake up late. There's no powered off DVR that failed to record last night's episode of The Walking Dead. Everything's wonderful. So Sally jumps in the car with plenty of juice to get to her 8.30 meeting and navigates onto the freeway. But at this point, having told the car its intended destination, she lets go of the wheel, sits back, and catches up on some email. All the while, the car is taking in data from both the infrastructure and other vehicles on the road to guide it safely and efficiently to its destination. Traffic moves along at a brisk pace, there's no accidents, and suddenly Sally finds she's got time to kill Time to make a pit stop, but not for gas. And now, thanks to Sally's smart car and smart infrastructure, she gets to be the hero who shows up 15 minutes early for that Monday morning meeting with a couple of dozen Randy's donuts in hand. And now, if that isn't the freedom and joy of no mobility, I don't know what is. Thanks a lot for your time this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Richard? So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a question to start. And what I'd really like to ask is about your role. Honda has all of these different things going on in R&D and different kinds of business areas, developing new businesses. How do you keep up with all of this? Yeah, I spend a lot of time uh, meeting people. I've been with the company 20 years and I've had a blind spot into R&D because I spent all of my career in sales and marketing. So I would see the products when they're ready to come to market. So um, one of the advisors in our group 
uh, has been with the company for quite a long time, and uh, he's introduced the engineers on our team and the marketing people to all the different R&D groups. We see what they're working on, and we explore what's in the marketplace and peer down the silos in the company to yeah. see what's there to pull out and bring to public. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Let's open the floor. Go ahead. Steve, what are the, uh, the major pain points for designing a hybrid drivetrain? Well, a lot of it has to do with the packaging because um, most of the hybrids on the market weren't conceived as hybrids. So they're already something else. So where do you put the battery? So if you look at uh, especially some of the plugins that need larger batteries, you'll see the trunks starting to disappear. disappear. And we're putting the batteries between the uh, wheel towers in the back, which is a good place for them. So I think packaging is one of them. Weight, battery flies in the face of what engineers want to do is strip weight out of the car. And then, of course, there's cost. Because a hybrid car is both an electric car and an uh, internal combustion engine car. So the performance has to be there. OK, go ahead. Uh, I saw a couple of your slides. You had pictures of planes. I was wondering if you could comment at all on any initiatives towards cleaner fuels for flight. Oh, that's a good question. Um, we have established a new company in the southeast a few years ago called Honda Jet. And we're in the final stages of receiving FAA approval for the fuselage and the uh, engines. And uh, it's a carbon fiber fuselage, so it's a lot lighter and stronger. And uh, we developed a unique engine mounting system that puts the engine on top of the wing. And all of this uh, drives increased fuel efficiency, and it's the most fuel efficient jet in its class. So it's the same type of fuel as opposed to experimenting with anything there? Um, it runs on jet fuel. Okay. But I noticed the airlines are starting to use blends. Uh, United Airlines, which I fly on a lot, is making a big deal about some of their um, blended fuels. Putting a little biofuel in the middle of the yeah. regular jet fuel. Yeah, one of the challenges, though, when you change the mix in the, in the fuel is the materials in the engines. So you have to be careful, and the, you can't reduce the durability. So you have engines that have been on the market. And this is a big debate about E10 and E15 and even greater mixes of ethanol. You have a lot of cars that have been on the road for 10 or 15 years that weren't designed for those types of fuels. And if you start to use those fuels in them, you're going to damage the engines. So you have to have a transition in both the engine technology and the fuel delivery. And that's another challenge. When I, was, when I first got my license, they went to the unleaded fuel. And gas stations didn't have enough pumps for all these different fuels. You used to have low, medium, and high. Then they had unleaded. They had diesel back then. So there's distribution challenges as well. Yeah. I saw your hand next. If you, if you look at the uh, you know, traffic jam cities in you know, San Francisco, Los Angeles, especially Asia, Beijing, uh, you know, Tokyo, and so on, what would you say if somebody said the solution of the future is not uh, different kinds of uh, power source because the jam cars is not a question if you have electric cars or internal combustion engines, it's simply too many cars out there. Congestion. What would you say the solution for the future is more public transportation? It's uh, changing people's minds, uh, you know, moving around more with a, whatever, with a bike or even, as I said, public transportation, different modes, walking. Um, so it's actually not the you know, uh, different, uh, different power sources for the car, but you know, changing people's minds, more public transportation and so on, because simply too many cars out there, and we have to get away from the car at all to make cities like Beijing and even Los Angeles uh, even livable in the future. For the, for the I think something that Honda supported for a long time are car sharing efforts. And they help to reduce the um, um, congestion. Uh, you still need cars, and the cities end, and uh, mass transit can't be everywhere because then it's going to deliver the same congestion as the individual autos do. So it's a blend of the two. Car sharing is important for that. Um, there are companies in Europe that are pretty advanced in that area. And I know you're going to see a lot of that coming to the U.S. very soon. But that's certainly one of those government questions, right? A policy question. What do you really, you know, push for the regulation side, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. 
So, as a poor grad student, I uh, haven't been in the market for a new car for uh, ever. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the last, the last, I remember hearing of Prius sales um, at a different companies uh, was that there was an extremely high demand but not enough supply. Um, and so, when you mentioned that currently hybrid sales make up about four percent of the sales in the U.S., I was wondering if that may be due to the fact that there's not enough hybrid available? I think it has to do more with what a hybrid delivers. So a hybrid delivers better fuel economy in what would be the city driving or the bumper to bumper driving because you're running on the battery. You're not accelerating the engine as much. So in a lot of places in the, in the country, city driving in particular, that's why the taxi fleets are adopting them. You also have, I would say, um, some twisted efforts for whatever reason to stimulate hybrid sales by allowing them to use the carpool lanes, which were originally developed for congestion. Now you fill them up with hybrids because they want to stimulate uh, the sale of the hybrids. So carpool lanes are in places like this, and they're in the south, and they're in the northeast corridor. They're not in Kansas. There's no bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic in Kansas. So I think you see very high penetration rates in some of these congested metros or in states that are stimulating the demand and not elsewhere. Can I ask a follow-up? What's the, has, did Honda announce a, a suggested retail price for the new uh, Accord uh, plug-in hybrid? I believe we did. It, I think it's thirty-nine thousand seven eighty. So, what would be the difference between that and the standard version of a regular gasoline-powered Accord at uh, this point? Uh, there'll be a hybrid also yeah. coming in the spring, but now they're all internal combustion, and uh, I really wouldn't know. But it's several thousand dollars. Higher. Yeah, uh, I remember a few years ago looking around and seeing about a five thousand dollar price difference between regular hybrids and and gasoline-powered versions of the same car. And that's and the battery so and the hybrid yeah, motor. Right. So the economics are tough. Right. So you have to do a lot of city driving to benefit from that improved uh, low-speed fuel economy. And taxis do a lot of that. Uh, some consumers don't. But if you get a carpool lane sticker, maybe that's good enough for you and you don't care. So I think a lot of people bought hybrids really didn't want hybrids. They one, the fast lane. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, now that big oil is so proud to give us our natural gas back and that we're not going to have any deficits, this kind of thing, what's that going to do to the introduction of your clarity to the rate that that comes into the market? <coughs> if there's no real incentive for anybody to bring hydrogen to the pump. <laughs> well, I think you have to continue to push towards the future because Fuel prices, uh, petrol prices, will continue to go up. And uh, they have consistently. They go up, they go down, but the long-term trend is up. Um, hydrogen can be manufactured in factories and distributed in different ways. So perhaps there is a cost opportunity there long-term. If not, there's the environmental impact of, of hydrogen. I think... Um, that's probably the most important when you think about the world 100 years from now. Yep. Um, Steve, I'm curious about Honda's presence in China. I was wondering what kind of government regulation uh, is there of the auto industry in China? And when you ship vehicles um, there, my understanding is that the Chinese emission standards are actually lower than those in the U.S. and Europe. So are Honda vehicles that are sold there comparable to, say, a California vehicle, or is it you know, it's China is a whole different kettle of fish. Um, first of all, we don't uh, we ship Acuras there, um, and uh, I'm not sure what the emission standards are there. And they have different classes of vehicles, but they're virtually the same Acuras that we we sell here. Um, over there, we manufacture uh, licensed vehicles in some cases, and we've introduced a local brand as well of uh, local vehicles. They have different standards, and I think they would be uh, wise to increase both their fuel efficiency and their environmental regulations as quickly as possible. You know, if you remember when they had the Olympics, there were all those stories about them shutting industries down for a month before to clear the air 
in uh, Beijing and in other cities. So given the sheer density and scale of China, they need to get with it. Okay. Go ahead. Follow on, his follow on. Uh, you had mentioned that the biggest challenge for electric vehicles is the cost, and you weren't going to share any of the costs for electric vehicles. Um, however, uh, can you share with us the cost of the engine drivetrain since that's the target? You need to be competitive with it. Gasoline only. What is the cost today? From at least the there's two component. Yeah, there's two components to cost. The first is really the difference in materials, which is significant because you're adding an electric motor or two electric motors to an engine. And then there's the battery. But the real issue is scale. So if you take an Accord, and um, let's say we build 350,000 of those here, and maybe 5% of them are a plug-in or a hybrid. So you can see you don't have the scale to amortize those differences. Over so that's really where a lot of the cost uh, comes from. I I couldn't even give you specifics because I don't know. But the biggest factor is volume. And whether you build one car or a million, the getting in cost is just about the same, and it's steep. I, I was just gonna bring that back. It sounds like a chicken and egg problem in terms of price. People won't buy them because they're too expensive, so you don't make as many. So it's more expensive. <laughs> so yeah. how do you get out of that cycle? You take a huge loss. <laughs> <laughs> and you make it up elsewhere. Back in the back. Uh, natural gas is getting a lot cheaper these days. I think it's been the last 10 years that the technology went over yeah. there. Uh, I don't see anything here which I try to address. Uh, are you going to push more on natural gas cars? Oh, we certainly are. In fact, my boss is pushing me all over the place about it because uh, one of our responsibilities is for the sales of the natural gas Civic. And I think uh, that's a perfect example of a very easy transition for an automaker because you're using an internal combustion engine. Um, the gas is going to remain uh, available and at a much lower price than petrol for a lot of different reasons we don't have to get into here but you don't have the distribution of the fuel. So we've had, I think I said, four or five generations of natural gas Civic sedans. These cars are bulletproof. They don't give us or the consumers any trouble. Um, you don't have fuel in many states. And um, there are a lot of companies right now, I spend a lot of time working with venture capital companies that are looking to set up uh, compressed natural gas distribution. In, in many different business models. And I think uh, they're cleaner, they're not zero carbon, but they're a lot cleaner and they're less expensive to run. You can even refuel at home with it if you, if you own a home and you have gas in your, in your home. So I think that one's very promising, although the big challenge there, again, is cost and um, scale. But for a consumer, uh, to have 40% off the price of fuel, you can make that back uh, pretty quickly. Uh, in the heavy trucking business, the fleets, and you see in a lot of cities, the buses have gone to natural gas because the more fuel you use, the, the quicker you'll uh, break even on that investment. And also the engines last longer because it's a, a cleaner burning fuel. So This is an area where the Japan market developed in a different direction than the U.S. because Taxis running on natural gas have been a real kind of standard in Japan for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, how can an automobile company convince people to build out the infrastructure? And the smart home is a good example of that, yeah. too. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, with these venture capital guys and uh, encouraging them. They all want to know are there going to be cars? And again, it's a chicken and egg thing. So, we can take a loss on the car. Someone's got to take a loss on the fuel. And the same thing's going on now with hydrogen. So there's a couple of hydrogen stations in Southern California. There's a hydrogen station up here that either exists or is about to. But you, you spend a fortune to establish that station, and a car shows up every three days. And that's the problem. So we're all going to be building fuel cell cars. The government's pretty much said you need to have these things. And we've got a lot of expertise in that, and we're ready to go. But again, 
if you don't have the fueling, the customers are going to be frustrated. And I don't know how far you're willing to drive for fuel, but when you have three brands at every intersection of petrol, it's probably not too far out of your way. And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. And uh, I think the government's done a pretty good job of pushing the automakers around on this. We also need the encouragement for the infrastructure because it isn't going to succeed without it. And natural gas exists under any street that matters in the US, right? There's all gas pipes. So all you need is a compressor and a storage tank, and you can have natural gas fueling. Hydrogen's the most abundant element in the universe, but you really can't find it anywhere. So it has to be manufactured and distributed. It's always attached to something else. So your, your belief in the ultimate kind of winning out of the fuel cell uh, car is, do you think it's because of the way zero emission is defined? I mean, would a fuel cell car actually have less zero emission than a purely battery electric vehicle? Um, it depends, again, where the uh, core energy comes from. So if you take a fuel cell car, if it's a hydrogen fuel cell car, and you use electrolysis to break water up, and the energy comes from solar panels, then the most pollution or carbon-based pollution you have in any of that is what it took to make the solar panel. Yeah. The solar panel lasts you 30 plus years, so that's a pretty durable product. Um, electricity, if you're plugging your car in in San Onofre, and that was a, you know, a nuclear generated electron, no carbon, no pollution, but then again, you have to be concerned about what you do with the fuel at the end of the life. So that's what I said earlier when I meant when I, I meant when I said well to wheel. If you really think about it all the way, so hydrogen from water is probably the ultimate because you can make it from a solar panel or you can make it from the grid. But if the grid's in Ohio and it's coal power, it's not a real clean yeah. product. So you have to really think about it. Okay, go ahead. I was thinking you talk about fuel cells as the like ultimate flagship, but what if you do you see that if you have major breakthroughs in battery technology or some other charging, such as more dynamic charging of uh, the electric vehicles, that that would be like the ultimate solution instead? Well, you perpetual know? motion would be. <laughs> 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 but no, you approach that. You have to feed in some energy, and that was my point earlier in that. Uh, no one, especially the government, shouldn't pick winners and losers at this stage of the race. We don't know. And by everybody competing, competition's a great thing. By everyone competing and experimenting with these things, we're going to find the breakthroughs. Um, you all know from spending times in labs, you, you don't find those things laying on tables. It takes long hours and maybe a hundred tries before you get anything. I saw your hand first. Could you say more about personal commuter or commuter vehicles and their drivetrains and where you see that going? Very small cars, you mean? You know, it depends where you are. I think uh, the, the lighter and smaller the vehicle, you can get away with a lot more. And you can probably have um, electric vehicles that serve those purposes just fine. You don't have the range issues. Um, comfort and size and long distance, you probably want other kinds of cars. So. Uh, we have, we're very lucky in that we run the range of mobility from motorcycles up. And uh, depending on where you are in the world, there's different preferences, depending on where you are in the country. So I, I think um, all of those are possible. We're building a new factory in Mexico for the next generation of our fit. So that'll be an entirely new car. And there'll be some variants probably with that to satisfy those kinds of needs. You had one slide about mobility and joy and freedom. Uh, on that slide down at the bottom were some pictures of some things other than automobiles. Would you mention a little bit about, about what Honda's doing in, uh, now. I'll take you in some it. of these um, areas? One was a robot, 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 right? It's probably Osimo. Are you familiar with Osimo at all? OK. So Osimo is mobility. But Asimo's mobility for people who can't really walk or take care of themselves. So if, if you're homebound 
and you need an assistant or a helper. Asimo is meant to provide that kind of assistance by uh, getting you things. And Asimo is not a very tall person. And the reason for that is we've done extensive research with robotics and there's a, uh, a museum. There we go. Yeah. So there's a museum in, uh, at um, one of Honda's headquarters with all of the iterations and evolutions of Asimo. And the very first robots were like nine feet tall and they're scary to stand next to. And what we found is that um, Asimo needed to be at uh, eye level height with someone who's sitting. So that's the reason for uh, Asimo's stature. Um, some of these other things, so this is, this is meant to provide uh, strength when you're kneeling or sitting. And uh, we have used those in our manufacturing uh, facilities. So a lot of jobs require crouching and bending, and that can be very painful and destructive to your knees over time. So this is meant to support you while you're working. And this one here that looks kind of like a boom box is, I think it's called U, U3X. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see a video of me riding that in Japan. And that has gyros in it, and it balances itself. You sit on this, and it has technology similar to the way a Segway might work. And you just sit on it, and you lean forward a little, and you go. But the unique thing about it is you can go sideways. You don't have to turn. You just lean to the side, and it goes sideways. So that might be good for an indoor facility uh, where you have a long distance to go. It has a, a very factory. small footprint for something like that. Yeah, it's meant to carry. So what happens is these, this is what you sit on and they fold down and it becomes another black circle and there's a handle and you can carry it. So these are all the things we experiment on. There's other things um, which you don't see here. There's a device called walking assist, which is an exoskeleton, which is meant to help people who have impaired walking abilities walk. And what this does is follow your lead, but it adds the strength that you don't have. So if you're a stroke victim or have a, a severe injury, but can still walk with great difficulty, this will make up for the strength that you don't have. I've seen several hands. Why don't you go and first? And that's the Honda Jet there. You know, the see that? What do you call it? K cars, the 660. Yeah. Do you see them on the horizon over here in the near future? No, no way. No, I think Americans, not in any numbers. Not to mention that those would need a lot of work to meet all the crash standards and things here. I think that, again, I said earlier, every Every place is different, and if you've been to Tokyo and you've been to some very crowded Asian or European cities, you know, that's where the smart car comes from, the same kind of uh, requirements, congestion, and space. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just a comment on this uh, uh, chicken and egg uh, uh, problem we had earlier, <coughs> because uh, I'm involved in some of the electric mobility projects in, in, in Europe, especially in Germany, we have the same issue there that uh, first those cars come at a premium price of whatever 30% uh, more than the regular car if you just look at an electric vehicle. So the question is who should buy those cars? And the solution there is more to have a uh, joint, joint effort between the companies. I mean, you said you tend to take a loss. I guess if, if it's just the solution that companies should take a loss, then probably it will never take, take off because it will be no wild business model for the company. You so the solution always... is really. To have uh, you know tax you know tax breaks uh, for the for the consumers for example places in China or Europe you can get this car you know almost uh, ten percent or even thirty percent of the car you know back as a as a tax refund if you buy electric car for example uh, you know free free parking reserve parking for electric vehicles and so on mm -hmm. and all the stuff if you go uh, to Mountain View to Google on their parking lot you see that one quarter of the parking lot is reserved for electric vehicles right. for example there's free charge. There are a lot of closed, you know, really near, near closed, tight European cities where you go to the parking garage, you get free charging. I mean, you charge you for the parking spot, but not for the charging. And they do so that here at yeah. LAX. You can. Oh, it has to be, you know, charge. this is what I mean. This is, uh, has to be, you know, yeah. uh, you know uh, changing people's minds. Well, that's my point about the government. So yeah, the government needs to stimulate the rest Absolutely. of it. Yeah. Because, you know, companies can, can bear losses at the beginning, and you always do when you're introducing something, but you can't do it continuously. And the market won't eat what it doesn't want. 
So you can't legislate demand. You stimulate someone to make it, you have to stimulate people to buy it, and you have to make the environment rich for them to use it. That's where the carpool lane stickers come from and things like that. I'm not against that entirely, but they were meant for congestion and now we're using them for other things. But I do want to kind of remind people of one thing that you mentioned. It's great when the government gives goals for people to meet, but not to pick winners and how to get don't to the pick goals. You just don't know. Yeah. You just don't know. The CVCC engine was a very good example of that. Nobody thought it could be achieved. Yep. Th that you know the clean air standards could be achieved. All the other car makers were saying we can't do it. Meanwhile, Honda comes up with a solution. Yeah. If it was up to the government, we'd all wear brown suits. <laughs> right. We have an example of A one two three. But with picking a winner based on, on, yeah. on political decisions rather than you know, market I don't know. I don't know if that's it. Yeah. They're just throwing money around. To, you know, I said earlier that uh, uh, one of the engineers of my group says you need 100 seeds to see if one sprouts, and I think that's what the government's doing because you can pick on them for Solyndra. And there's, you know, whenever there's money, there's politics and there's corruption, and, and that's what happens. But I think the government needs to provide that kind of uh, tilled soil. Steve, I've got one more question. We'll finish up the formal part. Five years from now, how will you know, how will you measure the success that you've had with the EBDO? Hmm. Well, I think it would be in uh, uh, new product introductions, whether they be in automobiles or uh, uh, other products. Okay. That sounds good. We've got some refreshments outside. First of all, please join me in thanking Steve. For Thank you. Talk. Thank you.